Hello, today you'll be studying Storm on the Island. For your do now, I would like you to write definitions of these following devices. Pause the video now and give it a go. Number one, personification is when you give an inanimate object human characteristics. For instance, the mountain stood proud and wise. A simile is describing two things by using the words like or as. For instance, Sally ran as fast as a rocket. An oxymoron is when you have two contrasting or opposite things side by side. Famous examples of this are in Romeo and Juliet. For instance, at the beginning of the play, when Romeo is in love with Rosaline and he is lamenting that love, he uses words like cold fire and loving hate to show his confusion. This is slightly different to juxtaposition, as with juxtaposition you often have opposing ideas, themes or characters, so they're not words that are side by side. Enjambment is when a line of poetry continues onto the next line without a pause, so basically without any punctuation at the end of the line. Caesura is a pause in the middle of a line of poetry, so it's usually a full stop, a colon or a semicolon. Commas do not count as caesura. Finally, for those of you who attempted the star challenge, the first three, so personification, simile and oxymoron, are language devices, and enjambment and caesura are structural. So today you will be revising Storm on the Island by Seamus Heaney, because it's one of the poems in the AQA Power and Conflict Cluster. You will be doing this by answering comprehension questions, and by responding to an essay question. Let's start with what you can remember about the poem. Can you write down at least three things that you remember about it? And for the star challenge, any quotations that you can remember. Pause the video now. Please make some notes. Seamus Heaney was born in 1939 and he died in 2013. He was a Northern Irish poet, playwright and translator. His early poetry focused on rural life, so that means the countryside, um, on cultural identity and on ancestry. Storm on the Island, which was written in 1966, was written about the Aran Islands on the west coast of Ireland. If you look at the pictures on the right, these are images of the Aran Islands. The first one shows it from a bird's eye view. The second one depicts the Aran Islands in a storm. One interpretation of the poem is that it reveals the power of nature through a vicious storm which attacks local houses. A second interpretation is the storm is a metaphor for the violent political troubles that Northern Ireland had faced for many centuries. The structure of the poem is blank verse, so this means it has no formal rhyme scheme, but it has been written in iambic pentameter. If you remember, iambic pentameter is where you have 10 syllables, so five stressed syllables and five unstressed syllables, and they alternate stressed and unstressed. So if you think about the first line of the poem, we are prepared, we build our houses squat. You can hear the rhythm of iambic pentameter. When you're writing about structural choices, you need to explain why the poet has done this. So perhaps the rhyme scheme could reflect the disorganised chaos of the troubles in Ireland. However, the use of iambic pentameter produces a very structured rhythm, so perhaps it's a respectful rhythm which is suitable for the subject matter. This has some of the hallmarks of a dramatic monologue as the speaker is not the poet and the listener is silent throughout. How much do you know about the Northern Ireland conflict? Try to write at least three things. Pause the video now. The issues in Northern Ireland are very complex and I'm about to explain some of it in one slide so this doesn't by any means cover all of the issues. The Northern Ireland conflict dates as far back as the late 12th century when Britain invaded Ireland. In the 16th century, large plots of Irish land were confiscated by planters to make plantations. Predominantly, the ones who settled in Northern Ireland were Protestants from Scotland. 
In 1922, Southern Ireland became a separate country outside of the UK. Northern Ireland remained part of the UK. Seamus Heaney was born as an Irish Catholic 17 years after this, in 1939. This is a bit of a generalisation, but on the whole, Irish Catholics wanted Northern Ireland to leave the UK and to have a united Ireland. The Protestant Brits wanted Northern Ireland to remain in the UK. Catholics were treated badly and could face persecution from the police and government in Northern Ireland. Unfortunately, you just have to turn on the news to know that persecution by some of the police force is still very prevalent in our communities and around the world today. When Heaney was writing this in the 1960s, there was a civil rights movement for the Irish Catholics. Its ultimate goal was to end the discrimination against them. The Unionists opposed that civil rights movement, which eventually led to the formation of the Irish Republican Army, or the IRA. The IRA was set up to protect the Catholics of the North and to drive the British out of Ireland through bombing and terror campaigns. In 1998, there was a Good Friday Agreement to end the Troubles, but they are still continuing in some form today. The Irish felt they were protecting their land. However, the British have come to see themselves as Irish as their families have been residing there for centuries. Therefore, there is still a lot of tension. I've given you a lot of information today and you are not expected to write about the context of it in this much detail. However, you are expected to have a certain understanding of Northern Ireland and its troubles in order to be able to access this poem fully. Let's look at some of the vocabulary from the poem which you may not know. As ever, please write down the word you do not know and its definition. Squat means short and stumpy. Wizened is dried up and shriveled or wrinkled with age. Stacks are haystacks. Look at the image if you can't remember what haystacks are. Stooks are corn sheaves. Again, look at the image if you are confused. Strafes is bombarding with artillery, so attacking repeatedly with bombs or with machine gun fire. Salvo is simultaneous firing of artillery. So it's a number of weapons being released from one or more aircraft in very quick succession. Choose one of these words and explode it in the mind map. Pause the video now. It is important to note that this poem is one stanza of 19 lines. I have split it into four sections just to make it easier for us to analyse. Storm on the island. We are prepared. We build our houses squat. Sink walls in rock and roof them with good slate. The wizened earth had never troubled us with hay. So as you can see, there are no stacks or stooks that can be lost, nor are there trees. Pause the video now and answer the questions. As ever, these are my interpretations. Your answers may be different and that's okay, just so long as you can explain yourself clearly. Number one, the title is significant for a couple of reasons. Firstly, Ireland is a homophone of the country, Ireland. So a homophone is a word that sounds the same, but has a different meaning. Also, the first eight letters of Storm on the Island, Stormont, is the name of the Parliament buildings in Ireland. Number two. There are many reasons why Heaney could have started the poem with the pronoun we. One of them is that the Aran Islands contain some of the oldest archaeological remains in Ireland. They were written about a lot in terms of Irish history and ancestry. So the pronoun we shows a wider cultural experience. It could also show the community within the island getting ready to fight the elements together. Also, it suggests that there is an opposition, so we are prepared. Therefore, it could also represent the solidarity of the Catholics against the Protestants. Number three, the colon or the caesura in the poem makes the reader pause. It helps to create a sense of fear and tension within the poem. 
It also segues nicely into how they are prepared, so by building their houses squat. Number four. The word squat tells us the buildings are short and wide. This would ensure that they best bear the wind without being toppled over. However, squatting also has a second meaning, to unlawfully live in a place. So the inhabitants might be made to feel like they're squatting on their own land as they don't feel comfortable there, as they don't know when it could be forced away from them. Number five. The adjective wizened could imply the earth is so shriveled that they don't have the conditions for farming. The narrator puts a positive spin on this as there is nothing to be lost in the storm. Also, if we consider wizened to be wrinkled with age, this personifies the land as it implies the land is more knowledgeable than man. After all, it has been there for centuries and has seen more than man ever will. Remember, this is all one stanza, so I'm going to start reading from the previous lines so we don't lose the effect of the enjambment. Nor are there trees which might prove company when it blows full blast. You know what I mean. Leaves and branches can raise a tragic chorus in a gale so that you can listen to the thing you fear, forgetting that it pummels your house too. Pause the video and attempt the questions below. Number six. The device is personification and the trees could be company in terms of protecting people and providing them shelter from a storm. Additionally, the narrator describes the noise the leaves make in the wind as part of this company, which would make the inhabitants feel less alone. Number seven. Blast is a strong gust of wind but it could also be sounds from warfare, so this adds an element of danger to the poem. Number eight. You know what I mean is informal language or colloquial language. This contrasts the vicious language of conflict. Perhaps it's implying that this is everyday life to the inhabitants. Number nine. Tragic chorus is an allusion to Greek tragedies. The chorus would narrate the distressing plot much like our narrator is in this poem. The trees also represent the chorus as their leaves and branches make sounds as the storm hits. Therefore, if trees were there, they could be singing their own distressing music to add to the bleak atmosphere. But there are no trees, no natural shelter. You might think that the sea is company, exploding comfortably down the cliffs, but no. When it begins, the flung spray hits. Pause the video now and attempt the questions below. Number 10. Repetition is often done for emphasis or to make an idea seem stronger. The repetition of the word no emphasises that the humans are exposed and vulnerable to the elements. If the storm is a metaphor for political conflict, then the lack of shelter could represent the lack of a political solution. Number 11. Much like with the trees, the personification of the sea introduces the possible idea of natural company to the islanders. Number 12. The oxymoron is exploding comfortably. By having two contrasting words together, its effect is it creates an unnerving atmosphere. It shows that the sea changes from being comforting to being vicious. 13. The colon in line 14 is caesura. It's an abrupt statement, but no, and it emphasises a change from the comforting crashing of the waves to something more sinister. It also interrupts the flow of the poem to highlight how dangerous the times are. Once again, so as not to interrupt the flow of the enjambment, I'm going to start reading from the previous line. But no, when it begins, the flung spray hits the very windows, spits like a tame cat turned savage. We sit tight while wind dives and strafes invisibly. Space is salvo. We are bombarded by the empty air. Strange, it is a huge nothing that we fear. Pause the video and complete the questions. 
Number 14. The device is a simile. The sea and the cat is a clever comparison to make. It perfectly illustrates how the sea can be calm and docile one minute, then violent and cruel the next. Both the sea and the cat are natural and unpredictable. It shows us that we cannot fully trust nature. It is changeable. It is also way more powerful than we are. Number 15. Strafes invisibly, space is salvo, and we are bombarded by the empty air, all denote the same idea. They're being attacked by an invisible enemy. This makes their opponents seem all the more threatening and frightening. Being attacked by the empty air could also be a metaphor for the conflict no longer having strong and clear foundations. After all, it dates back centuries and the inhabitants and their politics have altered in that time. Number 16. The end of the poem is an anticlimax. Huge nothing is an oxymoron which makes the meaning deliberately ambiguous. On the surface, it could tell us that they have nothing at all to fear. Alternatively, they're fearing the weather, which is very real but something which they cannot always see, so it doesn't seem like a real enemy. Finally, it could be a suggestion that ultimately conflicts are not founded on anything too concrete. History and ancestry are important, but not wholly tangible and therefore not worth the loss of lives. Number 17. I'm going to read the words I found for the lexical set of war. Some of yours might be different. I've got prepared, troubled, blows, blast, tragic, fear, pummels, exploding, savage, strafes, salvo and bombarded. These words serve to give us images of warfare by creating a violent and hostile atmosphere within the poem. Let's look at the star challenge. I don't want to repeat myself as I've already explained the significance of the poem being written in blank verse, so in iambic pentameter without a regular rhyme scheme. I want to talk about the poem being one long stanza or verse. The lack of stanza breaks could reinforce the relentless nature of the storm, showing that there's no time to stop. The people are in survival mode. This is also shown in the regular use of enjobment, so going on to the next line of a poem without any punctuation to pause the reader. This enjobment gives a constant barrage of information reflecting the constant barrage of the storm. Now it's time to do your comparison. Your question is, how is a sense of danger created in Storm on the Island and one other poem in the Power and Conflict cluster? By now you should have already revised Exposure and The Prelude, so choose one of these to compare it to. Your point could be that Heaney creates a sense of danger through a community coming together to face adversity, it could be through the unpredictability of nature or through war imagery. As ever, to make your essay flow better, try to embed your quotations if you can. Make sure you select quotations with devices and lines where you can make more than one interpretation. With your explore section, I want you to squeeze as many meanings as you can for the quote. Make sure you link it back to the essay question about danger. Your zooming can be on a word type or on a device. And as for your zoom out, this could be the author's message of the poem or it could be context. So in order to have provided layers of information and interpretation, you may have already mentioned the conflict in Northern Ireland earlier in your essay. In which case, try not to repeat yourself. Only write about it if you've got something new to add. Once you have finished, email your work to your teacher so they can provide you with some feedback. Pause the video now. Finally, I want you to start getting in the habit of creating revision aids. These could be in any format which suits you best, so flashcards, mind maps, bullet points, whatever you think will help you the most. Select between two to four quotations from Storm on the Island for you to memorise. Make sure you choose ones with devices 
and multiple layers of meaning. Have a look on this slide for some of the details you could include. Pause the video now. Well done for getting this far year 9 and 10. I hope this has helped to strengthen your knowledge of Storm on the Island and how to go about analysing it. Take care of yourselves. <laughs>